our people lived off the land. They used the land. They used to see the loot, you know, they looked at the resources that were there and they, they utilised them. So it makes sense that when you're travelling across fresh waterways, rivers, lagoons, lakes, that you'll look at, well, what are the natural resources that are available to help do that. Mokihi or Mogi, as we, we know it as, Mogi, M-O-G-I, or Mokihi, it's traditional watercraft. Our tūpuna used to make mōkihi or mōgi out of, out of raupo or using korari, flax stalks. That was, I suppose, seen as an easier way of building a, a river craft, water craft, rather than actually having a waka. Hey, I know my Heidi Mai, he tended up. Uh, Ko Joe Wakefield, Taku Iko, um, no the te waka o Auraki, I hope. Uh, hey, no reira, hey, tena koto, tena koto, uh, tena rata to kato. People see, see Ropo as oh, just a clump of bush and they don't see its worth. You know, a swamp to us is a supermarket. When we go and cut Ropo, we found there was a lot of dead Ropo just lying there that hadn't been cleared away. So when we went through there, we were like clearing that as well. So therefore it allows the water to actually flush in into areas it hasn't flushed in for some time. So by doing it, it's carrying the nutrients up into areas it hasn't, so it allows for new growth. That's going to have a, a spin-on effect for you know um, species such as white bait for spawning sites and other species as well. They have to rely on the rope as, as a, I suppose, a protection guard. You know, rope is part of the riparian strips. You know, that take care of a lot of the nitrates, phosphorus, etc. You know, issues that are going on. It has an important part to play along with how kick here and trying to neutralise the pollution from the land use effects, the farming, etc. To me, what would have happened in the old days is our two pointer would have got to a river or waterway and they would have known that they would have had to crash across it. So they would have you know, decided right there and then, let's make a more key. You know, the flax stalks, you can grab at any time that, that when they're there. You can just go and grab a whole bundle off them, tie them up and, and make a raft or a moki and, and cross the river. So the same would have applied with the rope as well. If they were in a hurry and they needed a moki, they would have made one right there and then. You know, but these days we, we, look, we prefer to have our rope all dry. Those can go like that. The, the main concern is going to be uh, the, the layouts down below because that's where all the water is going to drip to. So, you know, on top, the wind and the sun will dry out the top, the top layers quite easily, but it's underneath. So maybe once a week, come in here and just try and turn it over just to get some air to it. The thing is, when the rope oil dries and shrinks, so we really don't know what it's going to look like until you actually see it dry and then, then, only then we'll have an idea of what size it will be. But definitely, definitely we'll be making one, one uh, not maybe full full size, but uh, we definitely, we've got enough here to make one. That's cool. So yeah. hence you've got your honeycomb effects. And inside it you got little pockets, see those little pockets there? Pockets of air. So that's what gives it its buoyancy. Oh, now you're not gonna eat that stuff <laughs> So when we bought the first bought the rope here, it looked like a, a real huge amount of rope. But over the last four weeks that's been sitting here, it's been drying out and uh, this, the low pour has, has actually um, dried down.
how I've measured the rope in terms of the length that's required for the, the rope or lashing the rope or together is I've pretty much just gone four times the length of the, of the, the rope or that's beside us and then just cut it. Also join the ropes so that I begin at halfway. So find halfway mark, we're starting at the middle and then uh, working out to the each end. You might have an idea in your mind before you start pretty much what you're wanting to achieve, what your expected outcome is, but you know, it never happens that way. You know, it's pretty much, you, you put, start putting it together and slowly, stage by stage, it will take its own natural shape. The key is the lashing because the lashing is actually going to pull the rope and the karate sticks inside together. When you lash it, you're actually tightening it up and it becomes solid. You know. And the idea too with the tightening is that there's less gaps so the water won't be able to actually come through in, in the inside. We've made the two sides of the base. So we've aligned each lashing up with each other, starting from the, the middle and working outwards. Okay, so we've got three lashings either side of the middle on both. Now we've separated them out. We're going to form what we call the puku or the stomach. When you're doing the base, that's really your, leash, your lashing really needs to be nice and tight and holding it together. The sides, yeah, a little bit different. The sides are just there really to protect um, the water from coming over the top. You know, it's not just about making the moki, it's also about the whaka whanuka taka that, that comes about it, that bond, that family bond, that relationship of people coming together, sitting around, talking. If somebody comes along and participates in the wānaka or watches us, you know, even just make a moki like we are here today, um, and, and they become interested, then Kei I'm happy with it, you know, because I know that somebody else has taken that interest up now and wants to get involved and wants to continue this on. It was the transport for fearing, you know, mahinga kai, uh, ponamu uh, people uh, from one place to another. And uh, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have taken long to whip one up. Once you got to the other side, you could just leave it there and walk off. You know, someone else would come along and use it. What's happened in the past, I've seen, is that people have made more kihi around the different marae, naitahu marae, and then they've put them underneath a stage or they've hung them out for a display, but they've never used them, and therefore it hasn't fallen apart, and they forget about it, and it stays there. In the meantime, no one's come back and made another moki. So the knowledge you know, is not quite you know, well known anymore of how to make moki because they haven't made one for quite some time. You know, so for me, yeah, that's the key is that, you know, um, keep passing that knowledge on, sharing it with those people that want to know. Uh, if you're able to do that, then you keep, the, keep that tradition alive.